Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode four of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike. That is Gavin. Gavin, what you watching on TV? So, uh, we, can, we can all hear it. <laughs> a little fourth wall breaky uh, on Tuesday nights. So I'm, I'm still currently uh, hanging out with my parents for the holidays. So uh, on Tuesday nights, we have my niece, who is uh, about one year, seven months, six months. And she lo- is obsessed with Moana. <laughs> so uh, that's a movie that I've seen now every Tuesday for the last, like, by the, by the time uh, the, the listeners oh, no. are, are listening to this, by oh, the time no. this goes live, uh, every Tuesday for the past month at this point, probably. <laughs> Which, like, of all the movies for her to be obsessed with, I approve. You know, it's a great movie. Hey, hey look, fair enough, but that's a lot of times to watch the same movie. Yeah, oh, for sure. But other than that, I'm I'm doing spectacularly. That is wonderful. This episode is going to be uh, our first episode that goes up after Christmas and before New Year's. This is going to be the first New Year's we've been apart since, what, I guess, the the fifteen sixteen New Year's was the last time we weren't together on a, on a turn of the calendar. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, because I, I know a few of our friend group. So how Mike and I know each other is through, and we, we could talk about this in great detail but just for a bonus episode yes we we both volunteer for the same organization uh and have been since uh you know so mike is a year older than i am but since we were both in our respective uh 11th grade years and so we but we didn't really become super good friends until probably that i don't know 14 15 probably somewhere around there yeah because it took you know i started volunteering when i was a junior in high school and then Gavin started volunteering when he was a junior, when I was a senior. And then we probably didn't start actually talking to each other until I was probably, you know, a freshman about next year, probably. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I don't think you or I either re- you know, really remember like the moment we came best friends. It was, uh, it was just kind of like, you know, you were a cool person to hang out with. And uh, I'd like to think I was the same. And we kind of gravitated towards each other as well as basically everybody else that is, uh, that is in that group. But yeah, so we've had, you know, the same Snapchat group chat going for probably five years now. We're it was probably since, close. It was since that first New Year's at my house, uh, my senior year of oh, college. Oh, that's that, right. That 16, yeah. 17, yeah. That was when it first got started. And so I, I'm going to, to miss you dearly. I know a lot of our listeners out there are foregoing a lot of their holiday plans, have already forgotten their Christmas plans by the time you guys are hearing this. And I, uh, I'm well aware how painful that is, but just a... Uh, as this is a science podcast, just a brief thank you all for behaving responsibly for, you know, you know, for the sake of everybody. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. And as I told my students last week, you don't want to be the last person to catch COVID-19 when we are this close. Yes. And also, just because I, I feel like this is obligatory of me, because as I mentioned, I am with my parents here in New York. And I don't mean this to throw some shade at my parents, but they sort of surprised me with a non-refundable t- plane ticket. <laughs> so I was stuck into it, but fortunately, New York has the strictest rules. So I got tested before I flew, and then was required to get tested within. Oh, my niece is right outside my door now. Uh, <laughs> that adds some uh, flavor to the episode. But uh, yeah, so I was required to get tested again once I landed here, and you know I was as strict as possible with you know social distancing, wearing a mask, and everything. Uh, in the meantime, before I could get tested, and you know, fortunately. Uh, the test once I landed here in New York uh, came back negative. I'm going to get tested as soon as I land back in South Dakota. Um, so this is a little bit of do as I say, not as I do. But but even still, you know, there's people that are going to be in circumstances where, you know, their parents buy the main non-refundable plane ticket and you can still behave responsibly within that context. Yes, for sure which is exactly what you are doing. And so uh, kudos to you and kudos to everybody out there who is, uh, is kind of doing their small part for the greater good. I think we can, uh, I think we can kind of take a look at today. Our last couple episodes were sort of dinosaur or dinosaur adjacent. And this is kind of a, an episode I'm really looking forward to because it, you know, we kind of got the red meat out of the way with those first couple episodes where we're talking about dinosaurs, which I kind of think is what, you know, if people don't quite know what they're expecting with a paleontology podcast, they're probably expecting dinosaurs. But yeah, the, this, po- this podcast is going to be kind of about what you do. And when I say what you do, it's uh, it's something called field work. And so I think we can kind of jump right into it. Can you explain to everybody 
what it is you do because even I'm not a hundred percent clear, like, you know, what a day in the life of field work is. Yeah, absolutely. So field work is arguably the most sort of enticing part of being a geologist. That's sort of the main marketing shtick, you know, if, you know, somebody comes to like a college open house and, you know, they're not quite decided on what major they're going to be, or they're like, oh, I'm interested in science, but I don't really know what to do more specifically than that. You say, well, do you like being outside? That's literally like the most common line that I heard <laughs> when, <laughs> when deciding on, uh, you know, walking around, going to open houses and things. So geology is really unique in science in that, you know, especially with chemistry and physics, most of that is done in like a laboratory setting because it just kind of has to be biology less so, but there's still a ton of biology that you can do, especially like molecular biology. Most like modern biology is done in a lab setting with geology. There is some of that, obviously, you know, geochemistry is one of the fastest growing parts of, of geology, but you know, for us, like the earth is our laboratory. The earth is our laboratory. That's a great tagline. The earth is our laboratory. Exactly. I stole that from uh, the head of our department at, at SUNY Cortland, where I did my undergrad. I'm sure he's or she is uh, absolutely happy that it's being stolen. So field work really depends on what specifically you are doing. Most of the field work that I have done has been in an educational setting. So a lot of it is walking around. Oh, I, I see a meme that I'll sort of reference here. That's very common where it's um, a, you know, adult bearded dragon with a bunch of baby bearded dragons around, like out in like a desert environment somewhere. And the caption says, uh, geology field trip. And then the instructor being the large bearded dragon says, children, this is dirt. And then just like little tiny dirt above all the heads of the tiny babies and it's like, this is literally what it's like. <laughs> just like dirt, 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 dirt. Uh, almost like the the seagulls from Finding Nemo. <laughs> dirt everywhere. And so, yes. uh, so field work takes place uh, outdoors. For us, can you, what is it that you are actually out there looking? Actually, let me back up for a second. When you say that this is in an educational context, does this mean you as a student or you as a an educator or something of both? I personally have been both but it really depends on where you are in your degree. So for me, uh, you know, and fieldwork can have a wide variety of sort of intensities. You know, we've had just sort of, you know, during the court, during the course of a lab period, which is about three hours go out. So you need to have time to get where you're going, see what you need to see, and then get back by the end of the lab period. Uh, so it can be as little as like an hour or I've been on, you know, out in the field for five weeks at a time. It, it really all depends on the scope of what you're doing. And so there is no solid answer to just what is field work, but very broadly, it's going to an area with sort of a lesson in mind and going to a place where you can easily show what you're trying, what message you're trying to get across in the rock. So for example, if you're trying to give a lesson about stratigraphy, which is sort of the science of reading sedimentary rock layers. So, you know, rocks formed by, uh, things like sand, you know, getting pressed, pressed together to form rock instead of, you know, igneous rocks, which are your magma rocks and then metamorphic rocks, which are your, your really like not quite melted, but almost melted, but with a lot of pressure rocks. So learning how to read those layers of sedimentary rocks is called stratigraphy. So if you want to give a good lesson on stratigraphy, you go to uh, a place where you can easily walk like up a hill where there's a big, you know, nice face of rock that stretches out up that hill. So as you walk up the hill, you can see different layers and learn about what makes them different. If you are doing something paleontology related, you go to a place with fossils. So you need to have, I, I have never planned my own field stuff. I've, I've been there as sort of like the assistant and as sort of a field helper, essentially. So I, I don't know what it takes in that sense. Uh, as for, you know, knowing where your local 
good rock hotspots are. But definitely once you're out there, it's a lot of writing down notes and following teacher teacher around. So as I'm as I'm listening to this, obviously, if you know, if somebody was going to be leading this expedition, they would want to know what they're talking about. But could you take you know, average Joe, could you take me out there with you to field work? And would I be able to actually do anything? Would it be safe? Are there special permits or degrees that you need to have? What are kind of the rules in terms of who is allowed to go out and do this kind of field work? That also really depends. So that's actually a great example of paleontology is that a lot of, you know, paleontology done specifically in the summers you know, which is when most of our field work is done, just, you know, at least in North America, just due to weather things, you know, in sort of central Western North America, you know, South Dakota, North Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, a lot of just normal people who like science will volunteer or even pay to come out and spend a week on a dig site. They will not get paid at all. Usually it costs them a decent chunk of money and they'll just be out there helping the scientists, you know, dig up fossils. So it really depends, you know, if, also, for example, this past semester, the, the class that I t- uh, taught the lab for, we went to a, a mine um, to learn how to sort of survey, which is when you see the people with like the tripods and the scopes mm-hmm. on like the side of the road, that's surveying. It's basically seeing, you know, elevation distance between two different spots uh, and also distance and angles between various different spots that you're measuring using pretty sophisticated uh, equipment. So learning how to do that inside a mine because my school has a pretty active uh, mining engineering department. So for, to go into a mine, granted, it's it's an old mine that's no longer active, but we still had to have everyone fill out, you know, waivers. Uh, we had to go in and test it, you know, a couple days beforehand, me and the other professor did, uh, had to go test it for like oxygen levels. So it, it is all sort of on a scale of really extreme to, hey, you busy? Let's go look at some rocks. <laughs> and just really quickly for anybody that's listening and all of a sudden that kind of strikes their fancy, is there a particular you know, direction we should point them in and say, hey, if this is you know, something you might be interested in, if you're retired or if you've got a free summer or if you've got a free you know, week, is there a particular place they can look to actually participate in one of these? Oh, I was just looking at a site the other day. I will, we'll make a cut at some point and I will find it. So we don't hear me clacking on my keyboard, but uh, <laughs> I, I will find it. And then do we have a place where we can put links? I was just about to uh, to say that. So one thing I'd like to try and start doing is in the description of these episodes, I'd like to have some links to things that might be relevant. So I've already got um, a note here to maybe put that meme of the bearded dragon and then, you know, we can also try and maybe include some links to places where people can actually, you know, check this out and become, you know, you know become their own, you know, you know, paleontologists, become their own scientists, try and do some of their own field work in a uh, in an appropriate scientific setting. Absolutely. And I, I will sort of vet the, you know, any links that we have just because some, some of these, you know, field operations are sketchier than others. So... All of them use this as sort of like a source of funding, because as we've talked about previously, paleontology is one of the lesser funded sciences. So, but some of them are a little more, hey, come be an active participant in the science or just, hey, come give us money and watch. And I, I feel like people would want to be the more active participant in it. So that those will be the kinds of links that we'll have, you know, down below. Wonderful. So we'll be able to put those in the uh, in the description of this podcast. So field work, it really depends on what it is, what kind of science you're doing, whether it's geology or paleontology or anything else. I assume it also depends whether it's in an educational setting, whether it is, you know, you're strictly investigating. And there, I'm sure there's a number of other factors that kind of change the way it is. We're actually going to get into a little bit. I want to talk with you about some of the field work you've done. And so you can kind of tell us just a little bit about the kinds of things you've seen in the work you do. But before we get there, I just want you to kind of explain to everybody, explain to us why it's important. Like, what is it? You know, we get that you're out there doing investigating, but there's been a lot of scientists that have come before you. Why on earth do we need to have more people out there to the point where in some cases amateurs can even, you know, play a strong role in this. 
why on earth do we need more people doing you know science like this the earth is the earth what extra value is provided by having more people going out there and doing this kind of field work so a big part of it is you know in the educational sense so when when we you know do you know in lab labs usually it involves taking what we learned in like the lecture like the normal lesson part of the lab and sort of looking at actual specimens so like we'll talk about what makes a sandstone a sandstone in the like lesson part of the class and then we'll actually look at stand, sandstones in the lab and that's just a very you know brief example this applies to different kinds of rocks minerals as well every mineral has specific properties uh that apply to them and the the specimens whether it's for sedimentary rocks igneous rocks or just the huge variety of minerals that exist the ones that we see in the lab like inside are sort of like ideal samples you know this is what you should be looking for however things out in the world are never perfect uh <laughs> you know it's it's really very very rare to find like a perfect specimen of something just out in the field so if, if you only say you did no field work in your entire degree program, but then whatever job you get requires field work, you're going to have no idea what to do because the things that you're seeing out in the field don't look like they did out in the, you know, in the lab when you didn't go outside. So you don't get the full education without doing the field work because, you know, as much as my experience is only academia type things, you know, college university setting things the vast majority of geology jobs are not that they are being out in the field whether it's you know water quality testing whether it's you know working on oil rigs which is uh you know a major thing that my my university sort of flows their students toward not not as much anymore but historically um you know they're out there in the field doing these things hands-on not just sitting in a room looking at rocks. So that is why it's really important because you don't really learn what nature's really like by just looking at a rock in your hand inside because that rock has been specifically chosen to see the things that the professor wants you to see on it. And so, so it's a lot more yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. You're good. I was I was I mean I was basically just going to kind of reiterate your point, just the especially in an educational context. We, you know, you want to have the kind of young scientists, the young geologists going out into the field and being able to do that work because on one hand, standing on the shoulders of giants is great. And the fact that there's already been a lot of good work done is important. But I assume part of what we're going to talk about today is that a lot of that work is unfinished and we still need people that are able to, we still need people that are able to actually go out into the field and kind of do the new science people that are still able to go out into the field and discover new things that either I did not even know was a question. The normal person would have thought had been answered, you know, hundreds of years ago. I presume that's kind of, you know, sort of twofold. We need to have our young scientists do it so they know how to do it. And we need to make sure that when those young scientists become, you know, kind of more mature or full fledged in their professional lives, that they're able to actually go out, and do that kind of good science to discover a lot of those new things. Not just that, but some of the old science was done either wrong or we just have better tools and technology now that we can do it better. So for example, maps. Maps are something I'm going to talk about a lot throughout fieldwork because especially for the, the longest stint of fieldwork that I've done, that's what we were doing was making maps. And the technology that we use these days to make maps, you know, specifically geologic maps, is way, way better than the technology used when most maps were that we, that we currently use were made. So, which might seem, you know, it's, it's a map, who cares? But that can really tell you, okay, we say, the, say for example, the United States gets into like, say, say, say there's a World War III, I'm not going to rule it out. We say the, the United States. Do, do, do suddenly, we get some odds on this? No. <laughs> <laughs> say, but say the United States really needs a sudden supply of like titanium. 
you know, for war things. Having a good geologic map means, okay, th- you know, here's where it makes sense to go in and try and find titanium or, you know, a good source of it. Whereas if the maps are not good, you might be looking in the wrong spot and waste, you know, $30 million in this case of taxpayer money, which obviously none of us want. And I think that's kind of a great place to get into what it is that you do. And I see on the notes here, we've got about 30 or 40 different um, examples of field work that you have done here. <laughs> and so I, I don't know if you want to go just kind of write down the list here and we can talk a little bit about what you've done and where you've done it and exactly how field work is like. And I, just one quick question before we get into all this. But when yeah. it comes to you specifically, I know there's a lot of different kinds of field work for different disciplines. But for you specifically, as we're going to talk about today, is there a lot of commonalities between you know the different the, the different times you've gone out and done field work, or is every time a different experience? It really does sort of depend. So the majority of the time I have been camping, you know, living in a tent, you know, not even in like a camper, like literally it's just in a tent, you know, usually a one person tent. Um, but there have been, I think once where I was in a hotel and like that might be, if you're not as into camping or have the camping gear that I have, that might be a major thing for somebody. However, but like I said, you know, this can, you know, we're, we're going to go through the whole gamut here of, you know, one day or even like one to two hour trips to being out in the field for five weeks at a time. So there, there is commonalities in that you will generally need some tools, especially geologic field work. You will need a hammer. Uh, I have several. And <laughs> so I have my hammer for hard rocks and my hammer for soft rocks. My hammer for hard rocks is a two and a half pound sledge. And my hammer for soft rocks is sort of like a ball peen hammer, uh, except instead of like the end to pry up nails. It's instead just like longer and flat without like the sort of fork in the middle. And that's used as like a chisel. So yeah, you will need a, a hammer depending on what kind of rocks you're going to be dealing with. You will need sort of a hand lens, which is like a little tiny, um, like magnifying glass, essentially that lets you get a better, you know, closer look at what you're doing. Because frequently if you just pick up a rock or you find, you know, an exposed like cliff, you go up and look at it. It's going to be pretty weathered, so you're not going to be able to see the details that you need to see to properly, you know, describe that rock in a scientific way. So you need to break off part of it with your hammer and then look at the freshly broken part to be able to see the details that you need to see because it's not weathered. Just because, you know, water, uh, wind, different chemical stuff, even just like having moss grow on it can really change like the chemistry of that rock and make it look different. So you want sort of an unexposed face to be able to get a good representative sample of what that rock actually is. Okay. But other than that, you really don't need that many tools other than like, obviously if you're camping, you need camping type stuff. But as for like geology tools, that is pretty much all that was ever required of me to have. Obviously there are many things that are nice to have, such as, you know, smaller chisels um, that you can just use to sort of break off a piece of rock. So you're not just hitting a cliff face with a hammer and hope you break off a good piece. Collection bags are also really nice to have in collection. So like if you find like a good fossil, you need to wrap it up in some kind of paper, preferably acid free paper, because the acid in in normal paper can also change the chemistry of the fossils and make them less stable. Uh, And then you need to put that in a bag somewhere safe where it's not just going to roll around in your bag or in your car if you have a car with you. Usually some acid, hydrochloric acid, which can be helpful in telling some minerals from one another. Uh, Although generally those minerals, that's, you don't really need that unless you're sort of using it for educational purposes, because for the most part, most of the minerals that do react with hydrochloric acid, you can sort of tell by other means, you don't really need it if you have, you know, a good amount of field experience. But other than that, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for really useful tools in the field. One of my favorite things about humans is that in kind of anything it is, whether it's a hobby or a profession or whatever, if you're not into it, you might think, you know, just how specific can can certain (laughs) things get? Just how many different types of hammers are there? And the answer is always infinite. 
no matter what you're looking oh, yeah. at, it's always, you know, there is an infinite amount of hammers. There's an infinite amount of different ways to build a computer. There's an infinite amount of ways to do whatever. That's one of my favorite parts about just humans is that in anything you do, there is, you know, a, a whole world you have not yet discovered until you've decided to go all in. And so let's go ahead and do that. Let's actually go all in and let's go back to Gavin's life circa 2014, 2015, while he's at community college going around state parks in his, is this an intro to geology class that you were taking at this point? Yep. So I graduated high school in 2014 and then took intro to geology one and two, uh, my second year of community college. So that would be fall 2015, spring 2016. And so where I went to community college, there's not a lot of really great places to just sort of go out and explore within, you know, time enough to get back in that three hour time span. However, there were a couple pretty nice state parks relatively close by. Unfortunately, though, with with state parks, because they are public lands, you're not allowed to we weren't even allowed to bring our hammers with us because you're not allowed to damage or take things from state parks. And we take we take that kind of thing very, very seriously. I don't doubt that, especially with as I'll talk about in a bit, I did some field work at Yellowstone National Park, which was incredible. And we were told, like, do not even like if you are seen with your hammer, like. I don't know. Like they couldn't really, cause it wasn't for a class that was just for sort of like a department trip with somebody who studies old faithful. I'll, I'll explain more when we get there, but uh, yeah. So when it comes to public lands, you can't damage or take things from it. And we take that super seriously. So I, at this point, I don't even think I had a hammer. I don't think I had bought one yet, but I know I love my hammer. You were, don't, you were don't, just a baby at that point. At I was, I really I'm not laughing. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at the hammer. I'm laughing at the idea. You, you had not yet had a hammer. You did not even know what, what you needed at this point. You did not know what this would become. I really did not know. But if you want to see some really cool geology, just go check out some of your local state parks. You know, for example, we went to, I, I guess it was, this wasn't a state park, the one I'm going to reference here, but we went to, uh, so I went to Jefferson Community College in Watertown, New York, and we went to Thompson Park, which is just like a, a city owned park, but still public lands, not allowed to destroy it or, or damage it or anything. And we basically talked about how this was sort of the only area for miles that because it's it's on like a pretty high hill, uh, the only area for miles that was not all completely destroyed by the glaciers in the Ice Age, because you know, where I'm currently sitting at my home or my, well, my parents' home in Northern New York, there was about a mile of ice above us, you know, circa 21, 22,000 years ago. But uh, for some reason, the ice just sort of avoided this one weird hill in Watertown, New York. It's, it's very odd. And so as we went down the hill, we sort of, you know, looked at some spots where there was some you know, glacial deposits, you can tell glacial deposits because they're generally, you'll see big stuff and, and small stuff, you know, like fist size rocks next to sand. That's really uh, indicative of glacial, of, you know, stuff deposited by glaciers because glaciers just sort of grind everything up and then just dump massive amounts of sediment without really giving it time to sort itself out by size. And so it was just really cool to be able to just go out in our own backyard and be able to see that. And this is, correct me if I'm wrong, this is kind of your first experience into field work. Did it like, did it hook you right away? Was it kind of a, a light bulb moment? Like, oh, wow, this is, you know, I think I might be onto something here. Exactly. And like, so there's, there's a zoo in Watertown at that same Thompson Park. And, you know, I'd been there, you know, a solid handful of times, you know, throughout, went with her for a variety of, you know, trips in like elementary school. I think I'd been there a couple times just like on my own because zoos are cool. And so just to be able to be like, I've been here so many times and never knew this and just having it shown to me and explained in a way that made sense, especially with what we were learning at the time, which is so, so cool. Uh, and then we went to, we even just took a trip on our campus, uh, on, on JCC's campus. And we went to sort of the banks of the Black River. Fortunately, we, we did this. Uh, actually it was a little bit dangerous because it was the spring when obviously rivers are, are pretty high just from all the melting snow. Uh, so a little dangerous, but we were okay. But just looking at some of the fossils. So the rocks from around there are from around the Ordovician in age, which is the second period of like complex life. So roughly, uh, 
late 400, early 500 million years ago. Yeah, I knew that. I'm glad you were able to clarify that for the listeners, though. Yep. So that's New York. New York's really cool in that, like, as you if you start from the top and then go south, the rocks get older because the the rocks are slightly tilted. So you start in super old stuff in the Cambrian, and then you just get or you get younger as you go south. So by the time you get south, uh, there's some relatively, you know, grand scheme of things, young rocks. But anyway, that that's a side tangent that I could talk about uh, another time. But and we 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 sort of just walking around in these uh, limestones along this you know river that I'd driven over because you know the the main interstate from where I live to get to Watertown where the college was you know crosses that river I'd driven over that river probably over a hundred times so just walking in this place that I've seen sometimes multiple times a day for years and being able to find these finding my first fossils out my myself in person for the first time granted they weren't you know dinosaurs or anything like that they were these little you know generally like snail type things um a group of cephalopods which modern cephalopods are things like squids uh octopus so they're they used to be way more diverse and have like shells on the outside so we found some ones like that that were super cool Uh, and i even found one that was about like close to a foot long which for the time was really big and so that was really one of the first experiences that I had with field geology that made me be like, yeah, this is the stuff. And that's the kind of thing that with a lot of disciplines, you're probably not going to get a moment that's quite like that, where it's hands on, where you're actually out kind of doing the work and it really makes, you know, kind of that impact on you. And I assume that led you kind of after that to going into the Adirondacks, still in New York, kind of in Northeastern New York for anyone who doesn't know. And, you know, what kind of, what, did you find there? What did the Adirondacks bring to that experience? So the first time I went to the Adirondacks in a geology sense, obviously, you know, it's relatively close to me and I like, I I have liked doing outdoorsy things for my entire life. So I'd been there many times, but the first time I went as a, like in a geology type sense was uh, the first semester that I was at my four year school, SUNY Cortland. So I was taking a, what was that called? Uh, mineralogy, which is one of the more basic, uh, classes because in order to learn about rocks you need to learn about the things that make up rocks which are minerals so you need to learn how to tell this mineral from this mineral so that when you get to learning about rocks you can actually sort of say okay this rock is 10 percent this mineral 15 percent this mineral and that can really help you with some chemistry things with some just descript general description things but yeah so that was the first time that i'd been there in a scientific sense and The Adirondacks are super, super cool because uh, almost all of the rest of New York State, with some exceptions once you get down, you know, toward New York City, but we don't really talk about New York City when it comes to geology (laughs) because they destroyed all of theirs. Anyway, but so all of it is sedimentary rock, like I described before, stuff that like silt or sand just getting sort of compressed together by rock or by more sediment being placed on top of it. Whereas the Adirondacks are about a billion years older than the otherwise oldest rocks in New York, which, like I said, were about 500, a little over, maybe like 520 million years old. Whereas one, some of the rocks in the Adirondacks are like over a billion years old. Super, super cool. And these are all metamorphic rocks with some igneous rocks sort of running through them. So completely different than anything that I had learned previously. And does that, so you said that you kind of live near the Adirondacks. Is this the kind of thing where you learn about it and you're not able to enjoy the Adirondacks recreationally anymore because all you're thinking about is the rocks? <laughs> does that, does, well, I mean, is it that, does it actually like enhance it? Like you, know, you want to go there more because this is, you know, a place you feel at home. Like how does sort of seeing behind the curtain a little bit and doing kind of science in a place that used to be just more for recreation. How does that kind of affect the recreational part of it? A bit of both. If I were to do something there myself, I would have a fantastic time because I can just nerd out all I want. But I feel like, I mean, if I went with people, I would still have a good time. The people I went with may not because I'd just be like, Hey, look at this really nice piece of granite or look at this really nice piece. Look at, look how big this garnet crystal is. And then just be like, sure, Gavin, go play with your rocks. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you would. 
Oh, I absolutely would. The the garnets in the Adirondacks are literally world famous. I, I don't doubt that for a minute, but I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna test that. <laughs> yeah, so they're they're used for at least ones in the Adirondacks are used for like water cutting. So they grind them up because garnet is not quite as hard as diamond, but still really hard. Uh, so they'll mix it up and make it really fine and then put it in water to shoot out of like like a really high pressure water hose. And you can use that to just like cut right through steel. Wow. Super cool. Yeah, absolutely. And so at that point, you're doing that with um, um, out at Cortland. And then what, are you kind of at this point still traversing New York in different classes outside of the Adirondacks? A little bit. It really depends on the class. So I'm really fortunate that at SUNY Cortland, our whole department was very field oriented. So every class with, I think, one exception had a required whole day long field trip, usually usually a Saturday. A required field trip. I love that so much. Yes. A required field trip. So uh, if you could not make that field trip, you would receive an incomplete for that class until you could attend it the following year. Oh. So obviously, you know, a little stress, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, once you sort of got used to it, it, it just became like a normal thing. But so it really depended on the class. So like I said, for mineralogy and then for sort of the following class, the, the following semester, uh, which was igneous and metamorphic petrology, which petrology is just sort of the study of looking at a rock and being able to tell how it was formed, basically. And so for both of those classes, we went uh, to different places in the Adirondacks. For another class that I took, uh, geomorphology, which is study of landscapes, things like how rivers... Uh, you know, cut through landscapes, what kind of, there are multiple different kinds of rivers. So like why this kind of river forms here instead of this other kind of river glaciers is a big part, especially in, you know, Northern North America uh, of, of the way our landscapes currently look. So for that class, we, our Saturday long field trip was measuring like a stream cross section using one of those tripods um, that I talked about earlier with surveying. So that was a whole day field trip, but a very different kind of field work in that you're not just out there learning, you know, this is what a, like, you know, the difference between this kind of feldspar and this kind of feldspar, which are chemically pretty similar rocks, but have some different uh, elements in them that make them slightly different as opposed to this one, which was, you know, in some of the, one of the bigger valleys in central New York that was carved out by the glaciers learning field methods instead of just enhancing what you learn in the classroom. So actually learning, okay, if you are on a field job, this is something that you may be doing something way more practical to a non-academic person. Uh, once they finally get a job in actual geology. So this kind of sounds like the place where the rubber met the road, those kind of first ones where you were going through a couple of state parks near your community college or going to the Adirondacks were rather important and particularly for the education of a young geologist are necessary components. But these kind of other valleys and gorges throughout, you know, western New York into central New York a little bit, this seems to be kind of where, you know, the, um, you know, they, as they say, they separate the, the boys from the men or the, the children from the adults. Uh, if we want to put it the way, this is kind of where it really became clear that if you were good at this, there was probably a future for you in this field. Absolutely. So that class min mineralogy is, I'm trying to think of a, a PG way to phrase this. Um, the way I would normally phrase it is a S word test. It's like <laughs> kind of harder than it needs to be because technically that is the class that you take your fall semester, uh, sophomore year of college. So you've only been doing this for a year at this point, but it's probably a little harder than it needs to be for that level. But it's like, if you make it through mineralogy, okay, cool. You're, you're probably going to be a pretty decent geologist. At least that's the way it was at SUNY Cortland and doing those other classes around that had trips through, you know, central New York is a really cool area geologically because you can see the actual bedrock itself, which is bedrock people generally think that's like oh something super deep it's literally just rock that is still in place you know if you have like l limestone cliff that's bedrock if you have you know granite which in north america is like the lowest solid rock 
you know, farthest down solid rock, that's bedrock too. So you can see bedrock. And then if you sort of go to the top of some of these valleys, you know, sort of the in between part of the valley, you can see all these incredible glacial land, you know, landmarks formed over the last, you know, 18 to 20,000 years when the, you know, the last time the glaciers were here, Su super, super cool area. And so I'm, I'm incredibly lucky and, and privileged that that's where my education was. New York is definitely, for those of you that are listening outside of uh, New York state, you know, I know most of you guys, when you hear New York, you were thinking of the city because that is anybody who is from anywhere in New York, outside of New York City, always has to kind of answer that question. No, I'm not from New, New I'm from New York, but I'm not from that kind of New York. Yeah. And so New York is, is quite a diverse place. And if you if you haven't had a chance to check it out, I am by no means a scientist. I have only recently discovered the outdoors and I've quite enjoyed it. <laughs> and there's quite a lot going on there. But eventually you did have to, you know, leave New York. Eventually you ended up making some trips to some other places over in the Northeast. I'm looking here and it says Rhode Island and Connecticut. I don't tend to think much about those states, but what was actually going on when you were taking your geology 400 class as you decided you were going to leave the Empire State? So, the, I mean, well, this was still through SUNY Cortland. So I was still, you know, based out of New York, but... We were very, very fortunate and throughout, you know, talking to all of my current office mates who have done their education elsewhere, no one else has had a class even remotely like this. So again, super, super in incredibly lucky. If, if you are a younger person wanting to go into geology, seriously give SUNY Cortland like a, a really, really hard look. But this class was uh, called Supplemental Field Geology, and it was taught by a different professor each semester and sort of rotated between the five main professors that we had and we took a weekend long or depending on the year a spring break long field trip uh, based on what that teacher specifically did so uh, the first one that i went on was with our uh what does she do a structure she was our structural geologist so she, she studies things like earthquakes things like faults uh and and you know why rocks are sort of in the orientation that they are in because sometimes if you see them Rocks are initially deposited completely horizontally. That is like one of the very basic rules of geology is that when at least sedimentary rocks are deposited, it is horizontal, you know, flat as a pancake. So if you ever see rocks that are not, you know, layered as flat as a pancake, some weird funky stuff went on there and she sort of figures out sort of the physics behind how that works. But she's also sort of our... She, she teaches historical geology, which is generally what you take the second semester of your freshman year. And so she knows a lot about the different history parts of, especially like the Northeast, the geologic history. There's been lots of uh, different mountain building events when, you know, when Pangaea formed, there was a supercontinent before Pangaea and other, you know, really large, you know, land masses colliding with North America to create super, super tall mountains, you know, like Himalaya sized mountains. Uh, along the East Coast. And that's sort of what the Appalachians are sort of a remnant of is, is one of these really old mountain building events. And so she's, you know, an expert in that. And one of the best places within a day's drive to see that is sort of Rhode Island and Connecticut. And I got to tell you, you can really explore all of Rhode Island in like a day. Really? Is it really as small as I would think? It is smaller. <laughs> so that was the first one that i did is we went and camped we camped at a state park in rhode island and we just sort of toured around the state you know going to different places along the ocean being able to see and and again sort of going back to creating a narrative and i'm sure this is something that you as a teacher know is really important to like getting the message to really click in students heads is you have to create like a narrative for students for them to be able to sort of put two and two together along the way. You can't just sort of throw things at them and expect them to synthesize that message that you're trying to get themselves. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't agree with that more. The idea of being able to reach students by being able to build a cohesive narrative, by being able to, 
show them why it matters or connect the dots instead of it just being, you know, all of, I myself, I'm a social studies teacher. I teach at the moment, seventh and eighth grade history, instead of just like all these things happened, being able to kind of weave that narrative is so critical for anybody who's going into education. Yeah. So we started looking at some of the evidence, you know, we were told, okay, this mountain building event happened at this time, you know, X number of million years passed by until this other one. And those are the two two main ones that we talked about were the Taconic Orogeny, which an, an orogeny is sort of a mountain building event, such as a big landmass crashing into another one. And the two that we talked about mainly uh, were called the Taconic Orogeny and the Grenville Orogeny. The, the reason why they're called that's not important. But they happened, you know, a good hundred million years apart. But they really shape most of the geology, particularly in New England, and then also sort of as you go down the Atlantic coast as well. But we sort of were told, okay, this is when these things happened. And then we're like, all right, let's go find the evidence for it. And so we did, we just, and she's ran this trip, you know, many times over the years. So she knows the spots to go to and has talked to like local geologists, I'm sure at maybe like university of Providence or, or something like that, because geologists are really scientists in general are really well connected where it's like if any of my teachers were to email so I say somebody at university of providence you know in rhode island i'm just like hey i'm coming to take a structural geology trip for the weekend got any good spots within like a day they'll have like a full roadmap already planned out are there any of these uh professors you had or any other people in the field that might be willing to kind of come on the podcast and give us an in-depth look at you know wherever it is that they might be located that really depends on the site. So sort of rewinding a little bit to the Adirondacks, there were two sites specifically that our teacher straight up told us he was like, if you ever take anybody here, I will find you <laughs> and you will like j basically just like, don't do it. One was the only North American location, at least known North American location of a really rare mineral called prismatine that my professor found. So he was out with a colleague from Cornell and one of that colleague's uh, grad students. And they just happened to be taking a break. And the student actually noticed, he was like, hey, do these crystals in this rock look a little funky to you? And so they looked at him. They were like, it looks like this other thing, but it the, the angles on it are a little off because that's how well they know minerals is that they can just look at it and be like, hmm, that doesn't look like it's formed correctly. So they took like a little sample and turns out super, super rare mineral. He got that published in either nature or science, you know, ar arguably the two greatest scientific journals that there are or like highest stature. So that was one. And then another was a really cool spot because remember how I was talking about fossilized bacteria? Yes. Um, I have an episode two, I believe. Was that the, the Jurassic Park episode or was that episode one? Uh, I don't Did I mention that. I don't exactly remember um, which episode it was. It was, you know, we. This is only our fourth episode, so there's not that many to, to go back through. But uh, fossilized right. bacteria is something I definitely remember you talking about. But as I mentioned, most of the rocks in the Adirondacks are over a billion years old, and so there is one particular spot in the Adirondacks where you can find some of those bacteria, which form these sort of dome shapes, uh, because the way that they do photosynthesis, these were uh, sort of plant-like in quotations. Uh, bacteria that did photosynthesis, but the way they do it sort of secretes calcium carbonate, that mineral calcite that I was talking about uh, as well around that same, I think it was in that same episode. But so as they grow, they sort of build up these domes of just layers and layers of this mineral. And the Adirondacks, some of the rocks were heated up to become metamorphic rocks, but not so much that they destroyed these domes. And what's really cool is that they got turned upside down. So you can find, you know, billion plus year old upside down fossil bacteria in the Adirondacks if you know where to go. That's a, that that blows my mind that just all of yeah. it, the fact that bacteria can fossilize, the fact that you can tell it's upside down, the fact that it, it is just all of that. The fact that, you know, that is a thing that we know about absolutely blows my mind and that you have apparently been there. Yeah. And honestly... Like one of the places I, I could, the, the 
location with the weird mineral. I could probably take people there. That other one, I probably couldn't find again if I tried. <laughs> um, I'm sure I've, if I look back at my notes, I'm sure that I've got general location uh, of it. But yeah, if I was trying to take somebody there, I would not. I would. I just wouldn't be able to. I don't remember that well. <laughs> and probably for the best for for your yes. safety. Yes. So as I'm looking at kind of the rest of our list here, we still have a number of other places for field work. So what I'll kind of propose to you, because there was a couple other things that I know you wanted to talk about in addition to just kind of the chip, the trips you've done, we can kind of make this maybe not our next episode, but at some point we'll have kind of a part two where we can talk about a bunch of your other field work experiences and we can make it, you know, a little bit of a longer episode just focused on that. But I know you kind of wanted to talk about some of the kind of pros and cons of field work as you've been able to do it. Yeah, I, I think that I like that idea because so we have just looking at our Google Docs that we share here, I've got one, two, three, four, five bullets left that I wanted to talk about. And those are probably the five most influential, you know, pieces of field work that I have done. Uh, so I, I think it would be good to sort of move those to their own specific episode, but pros and pros and cons of field work. So we've already talked about some of the pros and just that, like I said, you can't sort sort of sticking with the narrative of, of narrative building, you know, you sort of lay the groundwork for really learning what geology is all about in the class and in the inside lab, you know, this is the mineral calcite. This is what calcite looks like. Generally, it forms a cube, which is pretty cool. It fizzes with acid. This is how you know it's calcite and not quartz, which are very commonly confused for each other. However, until you are, you know, given a rock and just told, tell me what that is out in the field. Like so your teacher will literally just walk up, pick up a rock or hammer at a cliff face until he gets a piece. Or, or until they get a piece and just say, okay, give me a description. And until you're like, oh no, <laughs> now I have to actually do this. It doesn't really click for you. At least it didn't for me. I know specifically what, what will probably start that next field episode uh, with is field camp, which is sort of just what we call basically our capstone class in geology is that Generally, the summer before or sometimes after your senior year, you take a four to five week long field class that is sort of a culmination of everything you've learned. And boy, I got to tell you, that first day of field camp was something else. And I, I will reiterate this when we you know go, get to that episode, but, you know, it was 95 degrees and we were out there from... 8.30 in the morning until about 5, 5.30 at night. And it was miserable. <laughs> <laughs> Is it one of those things you can look back on now and say, oh, that was, you know, that was fun uh, looking back on it? Or was it one of those things it was terrible then and terrible, you know, looking back on it? That specific day, it was terrible then and it's terrible now. Okay. <laughs> field, camp in, field, field camp in general, I had a blast. I loved field camp. But obvious exceptions aside like that first day but it was like and even i've got my uh, i don't have it with me it's back in my apartment in south dakota but i still have my notebook from field camp and just looking at my field notes from that first day compared to even like the end of that week was like oh my god like night and day difference because <laughs> I can, I it can really imagine. does if you know like i said you really don't all, all of your lessons together, because up until field camp, it's all just sort of individual classes where teachers try their best to sort of weave them together with one another. Well, there's only so much that they can do, you know, especially when it's different teachers. You know, if it's the same teacher, you know, they know exactly what they told you the previous semester and can base that semester's stuff based on what they told you last semester. However, when it's different teachers sort of trying to weave classes taught by other professors into their own class, it can get a little fuzzy and sometimes it just doesn't work. But at field camp, you don't have a choice. And in field work in general, it's like either you know it or you don't, you know, it, it really is, you know, as you know, you've said several times over, I noticed that you say like, this is one of your favorite sayings is uh, when the rubber meets the road. 
It, I didn't and... realize, honestly, <laughs> now I'll become self-conscious of it, but sure. Yeah. I, uh, I never thought about it, but yeah, that definitely sounds like something I would say way too much. Not, not too much. Don't, don't be self-conscious. I'm just picking on you, but it's working. Yeah, that re- <laughs> 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 but when, uh, when you're out in the field, it really does just make everything click in a way that I don't really know how else to explain in that it just sort of works. At least that's the way it worked for me. And obviously I don't learn the same as everybody. People learn in very different styles, but that's at least how it worked for me and generally works for the kind of people who think the way geologists do. And that, um, that I, I'm not sure if that, that fits in kind of a pro or a kind of suppose it could be either way, but that's kind of, I, I love that kind of description of, of field camp as, you know, you either know it or you don't. And it's really where you need to, you know, as I would say, as, you know, where the rubber would meet the road. Is there any kind of um, anything else that goes in that either, you know, pro or con camp? Uh, field work is there any is there anything else that people should kind of be aware of when they're thinking about uh, field work or if they're hearing about you describing it and it sounds so wonderful is there anything else that people should be aware of on either side of that coin so i want to be very clear that i love field camp i love field work and you know obviously as i sort of alluded to and i know i talked about this one in, in episode one but you know, I am a quote unquote able bodied, you know, six foot tall white guy with a beard that wears flannels every day. Field work in general is pretty ableist. You know, for example, and granted, I want to be very clear, I'm not at all comparing what I'm about to say to like having a disability or something, but there was one semester where I very severely sprained my ankle. That was my second semester at Cortland, where I was on crutches for almost two months. And, uh, I had to do field work immediately after I got off my, in fact, I was supposed to be on my crutches for like another week, but we had my, you know, required Saturday long field trip. And I was like, I asked, I kind of asked my teacher and I was, I was like, what do you, what do you want me to do? And he was like, technically, he's like, I'm not going to make you give up your crutches. Like if you w- want, then you can sort of hang out in the van, but like this specific trip requires a lot of hiking even like climbing up a pretty steep ladder so he was like if you come you pass the class or you you know get credit for being on the field trip but you're really not going to learn as much so i went off the crutches a week early and i was miserable the entire day and so i couldn't even imagine what somebody who is you know legitimately you know physically disabled has to go through if they want to be a geologist. And in fact, it, the way field work and field camp, especially is kind of structured, they kind of can't be a geologist because like I said, field camp, this four to five week long field experience where you're probably living in a tent for most of the time and walking miles and miles a day in really strenuous conditions. If you can't do that, that's basically saying you can't be a geologist, which I think really sucks. It, it really sucks. And, you know, obviously as you said, what you had really wasn't, you know, it's not a disability, but it's really instructive of the problem that exists in, you know, quite a number of fields. There are different barriers to entry, but this is a real structural barrier to entry. It seems as though in geology, more so than in quite a lot of places where you really do need to be able-bodied and then throw on top of that, you know, the kind of people that are going into science as is, but just the the kinds of people that are able to go about doing this, it definitely is kind of restrictive. And so a lot of that good work that gets done, it's important to pay attention to who's able to do that work and, you know, who's not able to go about doing that work. And so while we're going to be spending, you know, while we spent quite a lot of time in this episode and we'll be spending at least one more episode talking about field work, I think that's something that we do want to make sure that we hit on here is just being conscious of the inequities in the system itself. Exactly. I can talk about the inequities in geology for days, you know, whether it comes to things like, you know, specifically in North America and then probably a lot through Africa as well. But, you know, just taking things from indigenous lands is a very, very common theme in geology writ large. And so that could, that should probably be its own episode by itself or something, you know, along those lines, but we'll sort of stick to field work for, for the rest of this episode. But another one is along the like lines of like the more 
when when people think of discrimination, the first ones that come to mind, which are things like race and like uh, sexual identity orientation. Like I also mentioned in the first episode, and like my advisor now in grad school talks about frequently is like, you know, the example I gave is if you are a trans person, you are probably pretty hesitant to go spend a month and a half in rural Wyoming. And, you know, I listened back to that for his episode not that long ago, and but I don't think I gave sort of the context as to why that's a bad thing. Not to hate on Wyoming in particular, but like one of the worst hate crimes, one, one of the worst hate crimes in like, you know, LGBT history happened in Wyoming. And I think 1998, where a person who, uh, a guy who was gay was literally like taken out, beaten to death or, you know, beaten nearly to death and then left like tied to, uh, like a fence somewhere, you know, miles and miles away from town and he died. And that caused, you know, there's a whole, there was even like a play written about the whole trial and everything. It's called the Laramie project. It's very good. Please look it up. But you know, given just that context, and I'm sure that there are many, many, many other examples of things like this, that certain, you know, people who identify with a certain, you know, race or sexual orientation or sexual identity might be hesitant to go to a place with that kind of, you know, violent or sometimes even nonviolent discriminatory history. And that's something that you need to be cognizant about, particularly because going to a field camp not run by your own school can be very, very expensive. So say, uh, you know, there is a university, uh, University of Wyoming is in that town, Laramie, where that happened. And, you know, I'm sure that University of Wyoming students do field camp, probably not that far away. So it's like, if you are a trans student at University of Wyoming, how comfortable are you going to be? And you can technically go do your field camp with another school, but that is incredibly expensive. And that's another thing that I is a major con. I don't know how much time I know, Mike, you said you have sort of a, a hard deadline for time. But it, I mean, we, I, the, I think kind of the point being is like, yeah, you can always go somewhere else just in the same way that if you're gay, you can find someone else to bake your cake. Or if you are black, you can go to a different diner or just go use a different bathroom. But at the end of the day, if you are being forced to because of some characteristic that you can't change about yourself, if you are being forced to, you know, if your options are narrowed on that basis, that is a problem. And step one is acknowledging that problem and talking about it rather openly. And I'm glad, I'm glad we've, you know, I'm glad now in a couple episodes and we will continue to do so have had a chance to talk about those kinds of problems here and just kind of acknowledging where those problems exist. And even if we're not necessarily offering any solutions right now, just the fact that those problems are being made known and aware to the broader population is a worthwhile endeavor in and of itself. Absolutely. And so uh, I'm actually, it's, it won't be live yet. It might be live next week when, you know, when, when episode five comes out, uh, but I'm actually working on starting a blog and that's going to be one of the first you know, articles that I post is about some of the problems with field camp writ large. I go into much more detail, you know, than I will about, you know, here just because, you know, we are, we are on a little bit of a time budget, but yeah, there's just a, a really long history of sciences in general and geology in particular being pretty discriminatory. And, you know, like, like you said, Mike, the, we're here today. We're not really offering any solutions, but you know, the first part of getting to those solutions is saying here is problem how now how do we fix problem first step in trying to fix a problem is understanding that you have one and i'm glad we've been able to do that and uh i'm glad we were able to have this episode this was a fun episode where we got to talk uh not so much about the kind of fields of paleontology and science that you hate but a field of <laughs> geology that you have some hands-on experience with so this has been episode four of i wish you were dead a podcast about things that used to be alive shout out to our one canadian listener i was looking through our statistics we have we have someone from canada that has downloaded if uh if we have any canadians there you know a to you this has been episode four this has been episode four i think that's okay to say isn't it i guess i is i don't sure <laughs> i mean i live five minutes from canada so i'm basically canadian right
right? Yeah, yeah. That's basically that's basically half Canadian. So I'm gonna go have a labat. Oh this has God. been episode four. <laughs> Everybody, have a great day. Thank you very much for listening. Mm.